Whenever I think about classic survival horror games, I'm not really imagining Sega platforms. I mean, hell, my brain's gonna wander to the Wii and GameCube before I'm thinking about stuff like the Saturn or the Dreamcast. And I mean, sure, the Dreamcast did see some Resident Evil games and uh, even Dino Crisis and stuff, but overall, there's not really that many iconic horror games here that you couldn't just play on a PlayStation. Unless you want to count, like, Typing of the Dead. <laughs> Does it count as a horror game just because it's got zombies? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't want to die. It is pretty damn fun, though. However, there is one horror game that is still exclusive to the Dreamcast that people really do seem to remember. Every single time I would see horror game talks surrounding Sega, the conversation would always seem to come to this weird game called Ill Bleed. I've seen this cover before, and I tell ya, I have always been estranged by this bizarre box art. I don't even know what's supposed to be going on here. Is that a, a doll face in the middle? <laughs> with, the, with the whole Two-Face thing going on? And who the hell are all these guys down here? You got, you got this goblin over here, and then... Is that a lumberjack with a wrench? It's the sort of cover that's impossible to discern anything from. Like, I've always wondered what you even do in this game. Who do I control? How does it play? All I see in the cover is a bunch of freaky ass shit. It doesn't tell me what the game's about. Well, maybe the back's got something. Okay, there we go. There's some characters. Uh, whoa, that's gory for the time. Jesus. And the brain guy is pretty freaky too. No idea what's supposed to be going on up there, but uh, let's see. Uh, imagine, if you will, a berserk B-movie horror film producer with a twisted sense of humor puts up a million bucks to anybody who can survive his seven movie theme worlds. It's a bloody mess of mutant monsters, over a thousand traps and items, and abject terror fused with B-movie humor? That sounds interesting. Illbleed delivers a badly needed transfusion to the been there, done that horror game genre. Well, I've certainly been there and done that, that's for sure, so maybe this will be something a little bit different. I mean, it sounds absolutely bananas. Made by Crazy Games. It sure looks like a crazy game. I've definitely never heard of them. Uh, they don't even have a Wikipedia page either. The only other two games I could find by these guys were an arcade light gun game called Maze of Kings and another Dreamcast survival horror game called Blue Stinger. Huh, maybe there's another one I should uh, take a look at someday. Shinya Nishigaki seems to be the one tying these three games together, having produced all three. I was kind of curious why his career didn't seem to expand very far past these games, and looking into it, it's because he unfortunately passed away in 2004, collapsing in his home due to a heart attack. Though while he was with us, he did make quite the journey. At only age 26, he joined Enix and helped localize two of the Dragon Quest games. And after that, he would join Climax Entertainment and would produce games exclusively for Sega platforms from then on. And I guess one of the last things he left us with before parting ways for the beyond was this bad boy right here. And buddy, let me tell you, this seems to be a cult freaking classic with a capital C. Like, you won't find a ton of people out there who like this game, but the people who do, they love the freaking shit out of it. I've even seen people claim that this is their favorite game of all time. I think I just might be holding something kind of special here. Now, I have actually played this once before, um, way back in high school when my buddy and I used to burn a bunch of rare horror games that we'd never find copies of. The irony. <laughs> now I've reviewed them all. Uh, we used to play a lot of those just to try them out, and eventually we got to Ill Bleed, but we only got about like halfway through the first level before we found ourselves really confused and lost, and, and then we just moved on to Haunted Ground. So, uh, of course, as is the case with all of these old frickin' horror games, Ill Bleed's incredibly rare and expensive, but uh, I was extremely lucky to have my buddy Andrew send me over to his copy. He sent me over to his copy, you know what I meant. <laughs> Shout out Slam Drew, you're the reason I'm able to take a look at this game tonight. I'm incredibly privileged and lucky to be able to do so. And uh, yeah, he even kept the disc in incredibly good condition. I tell you, not all heroes eat crepes. No manual though, the uh, cover insert's just a reproduction, which you know, it's okay, beggars can't be choosers. I mean, I just want to figure out what this thing's even all about. Find out why people seem to love it so much. Like, is it a scary game? Is it just like really fun? Or, or is it bad, but like campy or something? Why don't we find out already? Michael Reynolds' Virtual Horrorland. 
He'll bleed enter if you dare. Man, that's a good ass title screen. Oh, the bold, bloody font and the gates leading to the mansion and the rolling clouds complete with thunder and lightning. <laughs> it's pretty badass. For as long as I can remember, my family ran what we called a horror caravan. The story begins with our protagonist, Eriko, competing at her high school's 18th annual speech competition. I kind of like traveling, but all that gruesome gore got to me after a while. She explains that her family would always hold these horror carnivals, and her father was so obsessed with creating these terrifying contraptions for it that he would test them all out on her to make sure that they were scary. I mean, you have to be brave to walk through a den of snakes or try to avoid trap doors to make it to your room. Could you imagine that happening in your own home? Like, you, you fall through a trap door into a pile of bees just because you wanted to brush your teeth. My mom couldn't stand how obsessed he'd gotten, so she thankfully divorced him when I was six. What kind of speech is this? She should be saying all this shit to a therapist, not a room full of her classmates for a competition. After her speech is over, she meets up with some friends who tell her that she's a shoe in to win. That was great! I mean, you're the head of the Horror Research Club and... Hold on, is is that... What about you, Eriko? That's Ryan Drummond, Sonic's voice actor on Dreamcast. I thought we were toast for sure! You also might have picked out Lonnie Manella's voice too, another Sonic Adventure cast member. It sounds too good to be true. Not only does she voice Eriko and a number of other characters too, but she was also the game's recording director and even did the casting as well. So I guess it makes sense. She'd probably want to call up people that she worked with before and had a good experience with. <laughs> so Eriko and Kevin are talking to their idiot friend Randy about the speech when Michelle runs up with these tickets to a carnival called Illbleed. Look, we can win a hundred million bucks there. Yeah, if we can manage to get through the whole park, that is. After after her friends try to convince her to go so she can face all the fears she talked about in her speech, Eriko refuses, questioning the validity of the $100 million reward. I mean, I would too, that's a cartoonish amount of money. So her dumbass friends all go to Illbleed anyway, dropping one of their tickets behind. Ooh, maybe she will go after all. Yeah, she does, but for good reason. All of her friends kind of disappeared after going for Illbleed. She hasn't seen them in days. Did you see three high school kids around here three days ago? Uh-huh. Well, okay, <laughs> with that, we are now in the park. Time to go looking for our friends, and uh, I suppose along the way, we may as well see if that reward money's real or not. Okay, so here we are in the game's little hub area. It's uh, it's sort of like they made a theme park plaza out of a spooky graveyard. Oh my god, the skybox really sells it too. This is, this looks freaking awesome. There's a bunch of stuff you can do here between each level. We got Dummy Man's photograph in. Whoa, that's actually kind of creepy. Uh, this is just a save room. You talk to Dummy Man and he'll save your game for you. And across the way from there, we've got Mary's Pharmacy, this little shop where you can buy recovery items that'll help you through each level. So I guess that makes that Mary then. Oh, that's the, the doll from the cover, I see. Man, they really make this place look the part though. It's got all the bizarre clutter you'd expect from a weird shifty pharmacy. Boxes of strange drugs litter the shelves, you got vitamin power. Diet tablet? Super guard? What the hell is all this shit? It's really not often you get to see this level of detail in an old game like this. This is just incredible. Oh shit, I found the porno. Why don't we uh, take one of those suckers for the road? Yeah, that's right, you can even buy one. Well, this is the cheapest thing on the menu, may as well. I mean, like, what does this even do? Moving on, up here we have the visitor bank. Friendly aftercare. I think this is like if a character dies, you can pay to get them back or something? We'll have to see how that works later on. Okay, we got one last one way down over on this side of the hub world. There's the ER. Oh man, a spooky hospital with Dreamcast graphics. Hell yeah, look at all the creepy posters and shit. That's so rad. This is where you can spend money on upgrading your characters, and the way it works is just horrific. You'll be exploring a level, and you'll just find a weird organ in a tube. Artificial brains, iron hearts, artificial plasma, and bio bodies? Alright, Doc, here's 120 grand. Put that shit inside me, yo. Yeah, that's right, you pay these doctors to do operations, or they put these random organs you found in inside your body. You even get to watch a clip of them doing the procedure on you. The return to life operations are actually kind of gruesome. Look at that, that is some Dreamcast yuck right there. Oh, that is so sick. You can pay for one of these to bring a character back to life if you have somebody die during a level. Wait, what the hell is the visitor bank for then? 
So that's just about it for the main plaza area down here. If we uh, walk up these steps here, we'll then find the main level hub. Here we've got a bunch of these different theaters that are all playing a different horror film by Ill Bleed's creator, Michael Reynolds. Apparently all of the movies he made were way too gruesome for theaters, so the only way you can experience them is in his park. And when I say experience, I literally mean experience. These movies are the levels. So with that, I guess we'll jump on into the first one. We have the home run of death Jimmy my son this looks <laughs> this looks amazing you never expect to die before your dreams come true neither did Jimmy or his father each level opens up with this super serious horror movie narration that lets us in on the level's backstory the end was a total loss and so was Jimmy burned in minutes so basically, there's this innkeeper named Mr. Bonballo, and he wants his son to become the ultimate baseball star, so he makes him a secret baseball arena in the basement of the inn. And uh, after that, a bunch of hooligan teenagers accidentally burn the inn down when they're lighting off a bunch of fireworks, which kills the shit out of Jimmy, and the fire turns Mr. Bonballo into a deformed monster who vows revenge on all teenagers. Like a beast, enraged and bent on revenge. I love how seriously the guy takes a narration. It's like he really wants to sell you on every last stupid thing. One last thing before we get to the level, we always get a newspaper that explains the goal of the stage and what our rewards will be. Some bonuses too, okay. And uh, then we also get some hints about what to do. Like uh, he here it says that Mr. Banboro is weak against anything that will remind him of Jimmy. Whoa, okay, already the music and atmosphere is pretty freaking wicked. Um, we got a bunch of meters here, uh, my sight's going off, I don't know, I don't know what that means. There's a heart rate, that's gotta be health meter, I know that much. Whoa, uh, so I'm, that must have been a trap, I must have triggered a trap. It didn't do any damage to me, real funny considering the amount of blood that just went flying. It did put my heart rate up by five though, okay. So I approach the mansion, figuring this must be some sort of detector for those traps. Uh, oh, there's another one. Now oh, this guy's kinda freaky, I like this guy. <laughs> Ooh, he spooked us. Heart rate up 20, it did some damage too, and uh, this red meter? Oh, I'm bleeding now, that's bleeding. Six cents, what the, what the six cents mean? I can't, I don't, ah. Heart rate up 15, uh, more damage, bleed meter increased. Mm, I'm uh, really sucking ass at this. After wandering around completely confused for a few minutes, I then find all of my senses going off at once. Something important has to be here. So I look in the bushes and ooh, what do we have here? The horror monitor. All right, now we're getting somewhere. Sharpens the player's senses, can sense areas of danger. So this must be for detecting those traps. Yeah, let's just scan the environment. Okay, so the view will gravitate towards any spots that could potentially have a trap. And from there, you can tap the A button to mark it. Any correctly marked traps will then be deactivated, allowing you to walk past unscathed. So you basically want to try and use all of those meters up there to figure out where exactly these traps are. And you can't just mark everything all willy nilly either, because marking a spot will cost you some adrenaline points. And you only get so much. It even costs 10 adrenaline just to bring the thing up in general, so not only do you want to try and avoid wasting adrenaline on spots that are already safe, but you also want to be at least somewhat concerned conservative with how often you even use the thing. Each trap will correspond to one of your different senses. A sight is usually anything that's meant for your eyes, like a mirror or a TV or a painting or something, and the smell traps are usually stuff like food. Uh, for example, this little bottle here that had a smoke trap. That was setting off my sense of smell. Man, there are a ton of traps in this game, all of them with unique animations. Monsters coming out of paintings to attack you, creepy faces forming out of the floors, pieces of the environment flying at you and trying to kill you. Maybe something will come to life and startle you. Most of them are a lot more goofy than they are scary, but you know, I guess it is kind of hard to be scared by something when the game plays a sound to let you know what's about to unfold. Yeah, the game's definitely not trying to be scary. It's, it's just trying to be like schlocky and silly and fun. I mean, some of these traps are just straight up goofing around. So, uh, with the great variety of traps in mind, you'll be reading which senses are strong in certain spots and uh, try to look around like, okay, what is setting this off and what isn't? What am I close to here? Which one of these is it most likely to be? Shit. 
It's kind of like a survival horror version of Minesweeper. You know, like you're combing the map, you're marking the mines, and you're trying not to set anything off. Shit. I was really struggling at first. It felt like I was always either marking the wrong thing and getting hit by the trap, or I was marking too much and wasting all of my adrenaline, quickly screwing myself over. I had barely any health pretty soon into the level, and that's when I finally figured out what the sixth sense detects. Oh my god, there's enemy encounters! It's Dummy Man! And he's beating the shit out of me! Strength empty. God, he, he killed me. <laughs> yeah, laugh it up, you creepy, blurry game over face. That's, that's actually kind of scary. Oh, we're back at the title screen. I see, no checkpoints. You die, you gotta reload a save. Classic survival horror. Alright, so this really took some getting used to. It's a pretty weird system that involves a lot of guesswork, but I try to be patient with it, and I did slowly start to get kind of good at it. It's a lot of walking slowly. You're inching yourself around to test the waters, seeing which directions give you a stronger reading than others, and observing, trying to figure out, well, it's a smell, so what around here would give off a smell? Maybe this guy? Hey, nice. Cool. Every time you successfully disarm a trap, you'll then get a little bit of adrenaline back, so uh, if you don't waste too much and you keep just getting the right ones, you'll be able to keep your adrenaline up so you can keep on disarming traps. Now, while the first three senses are for detecting the traps, the sixth sense can be one of two things. It's going to be either an enemy, as we saw before, or it can be an item. So now it becomes this gamble. Do I risk saving adrenaline and not mark it? Because it could just be an item. Or do I mark it just in case it's an enemy? Triggering an enemy encounter without first marking it will have the fight off to a pretty bad start. Not only will your heart rate take a bad hit, but you'll also fall into the ground, giving the enemy a head start at beating your ass. And if your heart rate's already high, then you could faint or even die. If you did mark it though, you'll then get to start the encounter without any penalties. But of course, marking it is always a risk. It could just be an item, and then I would have wasted some of my adrenaline. So while you are able to take some form of certainty with the other senses, your sixth sense will always keep you guessing. The enemies can only appear through these six sense spots. They're not like walking around the map minding their own business like in other survival horror games. No, the fights here are like this totally separate thing from the main gameplay. It's kind of like an RPG encounter. When a fight begins, you'll be constricted within this little border that appears, trapping you with the enemy until the fight's over. It's very different from the survival horror norm, but despite that, the combat itself is still that classic clunky melee that these games usually have. That dodge has hella iframes though, oh man, like the invincibility period during the animation, it lasts pretty freaking long. The combat got a lot easier once I recognized this, once you learn like the enemy's attacks, it's not super hard to dodge through most of them, and also the third swing of your melee will do more damage than the first two, so you're incentivized to actually try and leave that dodge fest and try and figure out the openings that allow you to get in all three swings. Your attacks can also stagger the enemies sometimes, uh, some more than others, but it is super helpful when it happens. It makes it pretty tempting to get greedy, which doesn't always pay off. It's that bulky uncertainty. It always remains to some extent. They can also hit each other too, which can be pretty hilarious. Like, look at this, they collided and went flying in either direction. Alright, so I know a lot of you are wondering, what the hell is with the helicopter pad in the middle of the fight? So, this is a pretty neat and goofy thing here. Uh, mashing the A button when you're on top of it will have your character wave down a ladder from a rescue helicopter. Doesn't matter if you're outdoors or indoors, they'll somehow get it to you. It's, it's pretty silly. But I mean, hey, sometimes it's just a better idea to uh, dance around them and use the helipad to escape than it is to try and take them on. However, if you do take them on and you win, you'll get a bunch of adrenaline points. So if it's a fight that you think you can win without getting hit too much, then that's actually a risk you probably should take. 
And the combat is the kind of thing that would probably feel pretty unwieldy to most people used to newer video games, but as a classic survival horror game enthusiast, I kind of really love it. It's bulky enough to be clumsy and challenging, but not so much that you can't still get good at it. You know, like every encounter feels like, okay, this could kill me, I have to be really careful here, and that is an aspect that I really seek in survival horror games. And you've got the stress of knowing you'll have to go all the way back to a save, so you get patient, you focus, and it feels incredible when you overcome an enemy without taking too much damage, giving yourself more resources to work with later. Your health, your adrenaline, your heart rate, how much you're bleeding, all factors to consider when weighing the risk of a trap or an enemy encounter. I could die if this next one goes off. Should I heal? I don't have very many items. The heart rate may not really seem as important as the health and the other things at first, but if this is above 200, you can die of shock when a trap or an enemy goes off, so you gotta make sure you tend to it just the same. Also, uh, while I got the menu open, is this not just one of the coolest horror game menus you've ever seen? Oh, even down to the sounds and everything. Man, that's so good. And I love the driver's license showing you which character you have. That's such a cool freaking touch. Sometimes you can find more stuff when you're exploring. Uh, if you're lucky, you can even find something that the shop doesn't have, like in Amazon, this uh, potion that restores absolutely everything. Caution bombs will reveal all of the traps in a room. The calculator chip will show you the percentage of each risk. The item detector will mark everything on the map for easy pickings. There's the uh, scapegoat Mary. This is one of those recovery upon death death kind of items. If you die in battle, you won't lose that character when you go back to the checkpoint. Oh, yo, we never saw what the porno mag does. I just raised my heart rate. Well, that explains why it was so cheap. It's literally a useless item here just to screw with you. What you really want to find, though, is a weapon. Slappers only is no strat here. You're going to want to find a hatchet or an axe or something. Sometimes you'll even get a gun, which you can fire with the R trigger. One big thing to keep in mind is that you cannot use these items during battle. Don't count on tanking hits and recovering mid-fight. You cannot open this menu until it's all over, so you're gonna want these battles to go as well as they possibly can. It's all a constant struggle of resource-related decision-making. Marking stuff becomes more and more high-risk the less adrenaline you're left with. Sometimes I would run into fights on purpose, just hoping to get enough back so I can make it through the level. Bleeding can be kind of annoying, though. If it gets too high, your health bar starts draining, and you can fix it up if you have some bleed stopping items like bandages, but if you don't, oh my god, you have to either walk or stand still until the meter goes all the way down. Running makes it worse, which, yeah, you probably don't want to run much in the game anyway because it's a good way to fly headfirst into a trap, but man, you have to wait a long freaking time for it to drain if it gets too high. Probably a good time to mention how weird the walking controls are. Like, there's no run button, and you don't run just by tilting the stick all the way. Whether you run or walk is determined by how fast you tilted the stick. Kind of like running in Smash Bros, I guess, but like, I don't know, that makes sense in a fighting game. Here, it's just kind of weird. Well, at least the game doesn't have tank controls. God, I've read enough YouTube comments over the years to know that people hate those. But yeah, it really is best to be prepared before you go into a level, so uh, that sort of thing doesn't happen. However, there is such a thing as being too prepared in this game. All of the items you didn't use by the end of the level, they all go to waste. You can't bring any of them to the next one. Every time you return to the hub world, your inventory resets. So again, now there's that risk. You don't want to spend too much money. You don't want to waste money. I mean, you only get so much of it. So you gotta try and buy, like, the perfect amount of items. Not too many, but not too little, either. You know, I appreciate a survival horror game that can make me be, like, really mindful of each little thing. And, like, all the meters and stuff did feel kind of overwhelming and confusing at first, but once you kind of understand what every little thing means and you kind of get the hang of it, this actually becomes, like, an incredibly cool and unique take on what a survival horror game can be. Reading the manual helps a lot, too. Uh, I don't have the physical manual. This repro case ain't that fancy, unfortunately, but it is pretty easy to find a PDF on archive.org. Apparently, there is also a little tutorial area that I, I completely missed. Here it teaches you how to find the horror monitor, how to use it, and it explains how the sixth sense works too. Wow, that would have helped a lot. It would have saved me three shitty runs of the first level where I died after barely understanding what to do. I wish it wasn't so tucked away. It's behind the ER to the right. I, I didn't even find this until after I beat the game. 
It wasn't until my fourth go at it that I had a good enough grip on everything to uh, make it through. Hey, here's that secret baseball arena. I got Jimmy's trophy, got his plaque. Let's put these down here and... Number three, first base, Jimmy! This is where we enter the first unwinnable boss battle. A lot of times you'll encounter the villain of the story early, but you, you know you won't be able to do anything against them, so you'll just have to escape. All right, moving forward, we find ourselves in this big long maze where Banboro chases us. Yeah, a little bit different from the usual enemy encounters here. This guy is actually running around the overworld. If he catches ya, you'll enter another unwinnable boss battle that you'll just have to escape from. Not that hard, actually, especially after you get the speedy ladder upgrade that you can find here. Look at this, like, I get away so fast now. Wait, hold on a minute. Hold on. He teleports, doesn't he? Oh yeah, yeah, he teleports. So this is just one of many chaser sequences throughout the game. A lot of levels will have a part where you're not using the horror monitor, but you're instead running through a large maze type area, uh, trying to get to the end before they catch you. So here you just land in a fight that you can escape from, but other times you can fight if you want. Sometimes you're actually forced to win the fight before you can move on, which is really irritating, but I'll get to that later. For now, we're running through these corridors and eventually we come to this boy Boiler room. And this is where we find the first of our friends. Kevin, I'll save you, Kevin. Now for the real fight. It's not very hard. I just run behind him and attack him every time he uses the flamethrower. And uh, before soon, he's done. Bye, loser. Okay, Kevin is already dead. What, what did I do? Was I too late? Yeah, so apparently he can die if you don't get to him in time. And then he stays dead after that too. Like, if you want to save him, you have to reload your save file or start the game over or something and replay the level. And then you have to get to him within an hour. Um, I didn't know that when I first played it. I didn't know if he was supposed to die or if it was preventable or not or what. So I just kind of kept playing on and then I found that out after. If you did manage to save him though, you unlock him as a playable character. He kind of super sucks oh my god every enemy encounter he hits the ground like a rock and crawls around like a goo goo gaga baby bitch come on dude you gotta get up you you really have to get up he won't get it he's still on the ground i'm mashing the buttons i'm twirling the stick i don't know oh th no he's still crawling well i guess kevin sucks it's kind of hard to be upset that i missed out on him and the game wants me to pay three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars at the visitor bank to get him back that's way more than you even earn for beating an entire level so no thanks i'm not bringing you back you can stay dead i'm sticking to eriko she's way better well, at least we know what the Visitor Bank does now. It's so you can buy back the characters that you failed to save. But it's always so expensive that it's never worth it. So there's a number of different levels that have a friend that you can save and unlock, but you always rescue them in a different way. For Michelle, you just gotta find this garage in the second level and kill these enemies here. And for Randy, you have to find his brain in a factory. I guess they took it out after turning him into a wooden puppet. Go on, go on, go on. I mean, Randy was pretty stupid anyway, but yeah, this is definitely out of the ordinary, even for him. Each character has different strengths and weaknesses. Uh, Randy's got a ton of health, but his stupid ass brain gives him barely any adrenaline. And the shell's the opposite, barely any health, but lots of adrenaline. I actually liked playing as her for a while because it let me be very liberal with uh, using the horror monitor, but uh, anytime you actually slip up and set off a trap or get in a fight, you really pay for it. Pretty soon I realized that you're really just best off using Eriko and spending all the upgrades on her. I really wanted to try using the other characters, but it just felt like I was wasting the upgrades on fixing their weaknesses when I could just be adding them to a character that's already well-rounded, so I'm making a character better instead of making a character less bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's a crying shame, too, because, like, the idea of using multiple characters as lives, like, you lose one and you gotta move on to the next person who's still alive, that's a good idea that introduces a lot of risk into the formula. But since you always go back to a save point when you die, well, there's nothing stopping me from just resetting the game and reloading and getting the character back. You'll load into the same spot with the exact same circumstances, so there's no point in not doing that. 
If they wanted this to actually work, you'd probably have to strictly restart the entire level upon death, unless you switch characters. That should be the only way you get that checkpoint. And you'd have to not be able to save the checkpoints either for that to work. But, you know, even then, with how high the penalty is for losing a character, it would still be just too annoying to even bother with. Unless I gave you back all the characters every time you beat a level, that's like the only way I can see this working. Either that, or like making saving also an expendable resource, just like Resident Evil. That could work. So yeah, it's a good idea, but the execution was botched so bad, it's practically not even a thing. So uh, yeah, I guess that just about covers the gameplay stuff. There's how it's structured and functions and plays and all that jazz. And uh, yeah, this is a very unique take on survival horror. I've definitely never played anything quite like this before. Though, while a lot of survival horror games would use this sort of gameplay and structure and stuff to explore a uh, scary or disturbing story, Alebleed's kind of a lot more interested in just goofing around and being really weird and fucking strange. <laughs> So, uh, why don't we take a closer look at each of those six movie scenarios? I'll go over each level one by one, I'll talk about, like, uh, what the level is, what it's about, what you do in it, then I'll talk about the story and how the story of each individual scenario ends. And, uh, throughout the thing, in case you ever want to get off the bus thinking, like, oh, maybe I do want to play this myself, I'll have timestamps throughout it so you can have plenty of opportunities to duck out, and then, of course, I'll have one last big one before the, uh, final boss and me showing the endings and stuff, but, uh, if this does look like something you want to play, I recommend skipping these now. The story is absolutely bonkers and it's something you should totally enjoy blind. But otherwise, if you just want to see it all now, why don't we, uh, why don't we get into it already? Okay, I guess we'll finish off that baseball movie first. Okay, so after saving, or in my case, not saving Kevin, you'll hobble back into the living room and a gigantic band borrow rips the entire level in half, dragging your way out into the ocean. You'll have to hop from log to log as you avoid his giant swings. I could not do this at all at first. It was impossible. He just knocks you around and you can't do anything about it. And then I remembered, oh my god, the dodge, the iframes. And then just like that, it went from the hardest thing ever to the easiest thing ever. Oh my god, like the window of invincibility on this dodge. I swear it's like three full seconds. It's so long. After some clunky log hopping, we find this uh, little control room with a guy pulling levers and shit. Whoa, 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 yeah, yeah. Oh my god, right, like this is all an attraction. A big haunted house funded by some super evil billionaire. All those monsters trying to kill you? Guys in costumes. They want the experience to be so authentic that they'll just actually try to kill you. Well, I know you're thinking what I'm thinking. He was an animatronic too? <laughs> and uh, with that, the level is finally over. Right, the uh, second masterpiece we get to be a part of is The Revenge of Queen Worm. This one starts with you stranded out on some highway near this old worm farm. Picking up some documents, you'll uncover the farmer's backstory, how he had this huge supply of worms, but the demand for them was going way down, so he went bankrupt. So in order to get by, he sold the farm to a couple of opportunists who then kind of ruined his life. In this level, a goblin thing runs away with the horror monitor, so you don't get to use it here. This entire level doesn't have any of the usual Minesweeper gameplay, it's instead all one big chase, running through this foresty maze of dirt roads and avoiding the gigantic killer worms. They give you the item detector in this level, but then they have the nerve of showing you that there's an item at every long dead end. So you feel obligated to go all the way to every single one. You can't tell me there's something there and expect me to ignore it, so guess I'm running all the way down here. And here, and here, and here. <laughs> this level gets pretty exhausting pretty quickly. I love the way it looks though. Oh man, the Dreamcast trees, all the buried cars. This gas station is cool as hell. This level is probably one of the best examples of like just how sick horror aesthetics can look on Dreamcast. I really wish more games on old consoles would do this sort of thing. Like you play this level in GoldenEye, right? And you feel the drone owning ambience of it all, and it just kind of makes you wonder why they never made more games with spooky atmospheres on these platforms. So basically, we have to find fuel for this car so we can escape. And this is where the game dives head first into those classic ass horror game puzzles. Dummy man, knock down 
Dummy man. A dying man cries dummy man. Dummy man? Well, there's a bunch of dummy man posters everywhere. There's tons of movie posters, actually. Massacre in nature. Goblin moon. Yo, I love that one. Godilla? No, no, Godla. Size is problem. Size is problem is right. I can't even get to the flamethrower fuel without touching the mud and activating this unwinnable boss fight. Knock down dummy man. Oh, well, here's a wrench. Well, why don't we try this? Let's knock down the dummy man poster. Oh, there we go. Now we can get over. Yo, check it out. How many horror games have 3D platforming? I forgot to mention this. There's a jump button, and the jump's about as clunky as it is in, like, a GTA game on PS2. You do have a little bit more control over it, though, like, once you're in the air, but holy hell, is this, like, really hard to do? Usually, you only have to use this to, uh, get on top of something or over something, which is pretty easy. But here, and the log hopping, too, these are the two times of the game you actually need accuracy. Which isn't too bad with the log hopping, because landing in the water only slows you down, but here, you have to land on every car. If you land on the mud, you trigger the boss fight, you gotta run away, and then you gotta do it all over. Pretty damn good thing I'm really good at platforming, because otherwise, I could totally see myself getting stuck here. We get the fuel, we burn the worm, and then Farmer David gets to finally reunite with his precious Rachel. At last, we can be together forever! Let's go back to hell. Time to get out of here. All right, bring on movie number three. What do we got playing, boys? Wood puppets. A deranged lumberjack creates the perfect super chainsaw. But when he tried to cut down the ancient super tree, it grew a face and gobbled him up. I'm paraphrasing, but no, yeah, that's more or less what happens. We begin this one with a stroll through a creepy abandoned sawmill. Find the horror monitor, and then we begin to whittle our way through bit by bit. We soon find ourselves in a wood puppet factory. Conveyor belts bringing bodies to a machine where their skin's removed before they're turned into a wooden doll. Oh my god, that's so scary. I might just crap my hands and piss my hands. You'll even have to fight a couple of these guys along the way. They mostly just flail their arms around aimlessly, so even when there's more than one of them, they're not really all that hard. About halfway through the level, we fall into the conveyor belt, and we get turned into a wood puppet. We then spend the rest of the chapter running away from these deranged lumberjacks that want nothing more than to chop us up into tiny bits. This was probably one of the most annoying parts of the game for me. It's another big chaser maze, but holy shit are these lumberjacks relentless. I do really like the concept behind this part though. There's a ticket booth where the lumberjacks go to one side and the wood puppets go to the other, and there's a guy here who gives you a pamphlet explaining a bunch of rules. Yeah, it's all just another big attraction at it'll bleed, I see. Yeah, here buddy, take a pamphlet. <laughs> Try not to die. You can even walk to the other side and read the pamphlet for the lumberjacks. They have this entire side with a scoring system and everything. They also hide a little hint on the side about uh, some of the wood puppets being people, which I thought was pretty clever. The actual gameplay here, however, is just flat out annoying. You have to fight every single lumberjack that runs into you. There's no helipad, you can't escape. The only way to exit the fight is by beating him. And since they run faster than you can, these encounters happen non-freaking stop. And not to mention, there's a kind of no dodge button when you're the wood puppet. All you can do is run around and attack. I died a lot here. I didn't have many healing items at all, so the only way I could even stand a chance against this part was by winning most of these fights without taking very much damage at all. Why such a brutal gauntlet out of nowhere? Thank god there's a save room halfway through. I sure saw this room a lot. After enough practice though, I did get a decent strategy padded down. If you do this little leg twirl thing while holding a direction, it'll spring you forward that way, so I kept trying to do that towards his back, always avoiding brushing his front side so it uh, wouldn't trigger his attack. It is some clunkle junk, that's for sure, but hey, I did get good at it eventually, and then I was only taking one to two hits per fight, and uh, from there it was just about getting to the end. Randy's also here. You'll have to win the fight against these two dummy men to save him. They are cake compared to the lumberjacks though, so at least saving Randy on every attempt wasn't really a big problem. Phew! I'm safe! Let's get out of here! So I finally get to the end, and wow, who would have guessed? That's not the end at all. There's another room with even more lumberjacks! They pop out of these lockers, and you have to fight every single one. 
Though there is a trick I found that makes this way freaking easier that I found on my second playthrough, uh, thank God, because this was the one part of the game I was dreading replaying the absolute most. So what you do is you open the map and you close the map. And every time you do that, when you come back to the game, all of the enemy's animations reset. It takes them a second to get back out. So if you just keep mashing the map button, they can't move. I'm getting away because they can't move. Okay, there he is. And wow, yeah, let's do that again. Wow, he can't do anything, again? Yeah, see, there's nothing he can do. You can just go right on by. And this works on every chaser in the game, not even just the Lumberjacks. Using this method, it's pretty freaking easy to get to the lockers without even getting in a single fight. <laughs> Once again, a hard part becomes very simple. You just gotta know the tricks. Once we're human again, it's time to take on the big freaky tree boss. He's pretty easy going, mostly because we get the dodge back. Alrighty, next up we got the killer department store? That sounds awesome. A deranged business owner named Cashman needs to get out of some serious debt, so he holds the biggest sale ever and kills all of the customers so he can take their money. He killed all of the customers and stole their money and valuables in his warped mind. In his warped mind, he figured... Oh my god, he messed up the line and they left it in. Ew, is that Cashman? Terror, Jesus, Murphy. The sheer power of Cashman's hatred and his ruthless obsession with money brought him back to life as a horrible monster. Yeah, that's just how it works in real life. This can be a pretty mean freaking level. I mean, first off, they put a trap right beside where you start. You dick. This one's pretty tough, and pretty freaking long too. Lots of hallways with tons of potential trap spots. Marking just the correct ones can be pretty hard here. It was one of the few levels that I actually found myself using that caution bomb. Damn, that's helpful as hell. The traps in this one can be anything you see on the shelves. Various food products, candy, toys, anything that's for sale. And each time they get you, they'll steal a bunch of your money. So the whole gimmick of this level is that they give you the reward money up front instead. And every trap takes money away, so the less you get hit, the more you get to keep. That is such a fun idea for a level. Oh wow, wow, I love this food court, it's so spooky! And you can even read everything that's on the menu too. Oh dude, I want a delicious burger. See, it's not a delicious burger, it's a delicious burger. Before you can get past this part, you have to find some sort of decoration for this evil hell cake here. Uh, hi, I'm the cake room hell. <laughs> and there's a couple of red herrings, but what he wants is this severed head. Well, it is a spooky cake after all, I guess it makes sense. Kind of annoying that I missed it though, I had to go all the way back to the first room to pick it up. Onwards, we have the produce section. Oh, and there's a bunch of meat you can pick up. It even restores a lot of health, too. What? I can pick up this much? Well, damn, I guess this is their apology for how stingy the wood puppets level was. Hey, food for days! Oh, it's part of a puzzle. You gotta feed these big hungry cockroaches to get them out of the way. And then what happens? The game goes, why'd you pick up all that meat, dumbass? Time to fight the leftovers. Wow, talk about a beginner's trap. Well, I see why they made it recover so much, so I'd pick it all up and get screwed over here. After that, there's a kind of annoying chaser sequence with the worms again, and then there's this ridiculously hard boss fight where you have to fight three of them at once. It took me a lot of tries to do, but the trick really is to hit them with that third swing. Like I said before, it does way more damage. You'll pretty much have to do that if you want to keep up with them. God, this entire worm part feels like a whole lot of useless padding. It's just so disconnected from the rest of the level. It feels really unnecessary. I wish it wasn't here. Next up, we got the toy section. We got all the hottest toys. Robot toys, UFO toys, Killer Invader. We got a whole aisle dedicated to magic tricks. We got Dash Man. It's a Dash sale. What's this, a movie poster? Make a dream. Oh, it's a video game! We got new soft, new soft! All sorts of memorable soft, like Dino. Why are the controllers so big? You'd have to be a freaking ogre to play this thing. And what's with the sides of these baseballs? How big are the freaking kids buying these toys? Eventually, we'll start running into Mary. Yeah, that creepy doll from the pharmacy. She's gonna want to play a couple of games with you. Uh, the first one's another chaser maze where you gotta find four pieces of a key to escape. I kind of love how it's a bunch of aisles that sell nothing but Mary dolls. It's actually kind of creepy. Just like the Lumberjacks, you'll have to win a fight against her if she finds you. But thankfully, she's nowhere near as annoying to beat. After that, we got this hide-and-seek game. Um, I don't think there's any way to actually tell where she's hiding. 
I think you just have to guess until you get it right. But you take a bunch of damage every time you get a wrong guess, so it's like, good luck. Though I never do seem to die before I find her, and I've done multiple playthroughs of this game, so I don't know. Maybe I'm just lucky. And finally, we got the jump rope of doom. Don't get hit. It'll hurt. Holy shit, you got enough blood to fill a bus flying in every direction, and you barely take any damage. Oh man, the delay on that jump, that is, ooh, you really gotta be careful with the timing. Yeah, this is definitely one of those things that's designed just to be annoying, but it's not the hardest thing in the world, though they do slow down at the very end just to mess you up, you jerks. Once we're done that, we can finally face off with Cashman and his big cash vault. He's a spider for some reason now? I don't know, I stopped asking questions a while ago. As per usual, the dude's invincible, but we climb up these money stairs here and you can steal the controls. Hehe, <laughs> yeah, what are you gonna do, sucker? I'm in control now, Cash Man, you can't even... Oh shit, this game does have tank controls. Make him crash into the wall a couple of times and you're as good as done. Yo, we got Killer Man next. Oh, Killer Man! Okay, so K Killer Man is actually one of the coolest chapters in this game, so just a reminder, you still have that timestamp if you want to skip and keep the surprises, huh? No? Okay, let's talk about Killer Man. So unlike all of the other levels that have you entering the world of the film right out of the gate, here we actually get to see the theater before the film starts. So basically what happens here is something goes wrong before the attraction could begin. We stumble into a back room and we find the operator dead. Someone got killed in the monitor room. It then becomes this real murder mystery where somebody stole a Killer Man costume and is recreating the murders that were supposed to be part of the attraction, even leaving the character's signature star on the faces of his victims. Look, another killer star. The entire level takes place in the back rooms of Illbleed. You'll walk through warehouses full of props from all the other levels, boxes containing animatronics and costumes of every enemy you fought so far stretch on and on in these endless storage units. I'm sure one killer man. Not good at all. Along the way, we get a bunch of Scooby-Doo ass cut scenes where you and this journalist Yorg are trying to figure out who's been killing everybody. I bet he used some wire or powerful springs like a magician. Yeah, that must be it. Illbleed has a lot of tricksters and special effects artists. At a point, the game even asks yeah. you to predict who you think Killer Man's gonna turn out to be. Come on, you can figure it out. Can't you? Was it us? How the hell could it have been us? Cunningham? Yeah, that seems probably right, actually. Yorg? Well, how could it have been Yorg? He was with us the entire time. I mean, hell, at a point we see him in the same room as Killer Man when he's killing somebody. Look at that, it couldn't possibly be him. Unless... Unless he's just like Dragon Ball Naruto fast. No, wait, it's gotta be Yorg. It's the so obviously not, so it obviously is answer. And this game doesn't take itself seriously at all. I bet it is him. It's totally Yorg. Wait, Killer Man? Killer Man is straight up an option? Why would it be this? There's no way. Like, they totally want you to think it's so obvious that it's obviously not, so it obviously is. But it obviously isn't, so no, I'm guessing Yorg. It wasn't Jorg. It was Killer Man. That you you click Killer Man. That's the correct answer. You guess Killer Man on that menu, you get the prize money because that's right. And yeah, they give you a million dollars if you get it right. One million. On my second playthrough, I was able to upgrade the absolute shit out of everybody. How insulting is that? You get such a ludicrous, overpowered reward that'll make the rest of your playthrough easy as hell if you happen to pick the dumbest option. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, the final area after this part is this exhaustingly huge maze room. There's only like two traps in the whole place and there's no chasers and only like one or two enemy encounters. So it's just like this really long, monotonous, boring chunk of the game where you're running in circles, just trying to figure out how to get to the end and it, it goes on forever. And I just kept wishing I could run like twice as fast and I, I hated it. 
And what's worse is that you have to find this minecart somewhere in the maze to save Yorg or he dies. I don't know if it's Jorg or Yorg, but I don't care. Anyway, you better find him in this big mess if you want to get all the characters. And uh, yeah, yeah, you do get to play as him once you save him um, for one entire room. The next level is the last level, which means it's the only level you get to play as him in. And in that level, it's kind of like Wood Puppets, where you play as a unique character no matter who you pick. So you do the first room, you get turned into a different character, and then, well, that's all you got to be Jorg for, so pff, add up to the pile of useless characters, I guess. The boss fight with Killer Man is pretty ridiculous. I mean, look at this room. It's made of faces shrieking in pain. I don't know how fitting it is, but it's still pretty wild. He also launches these Kamehameha waves at you, which, as per usual, actually pretty easy to dodge thanks to those tasty iframes. You also have a shotgun with, like, ridiculous reach in this level, so keep your distance, keep dodging, keep firing, and he's as good as toast. Alright, so last chance to skip one of the chapters and have something in the game you haven't seen because... This last one is one of the nuttiest things I've ever seen in a video game. Toy Hunter, Cork Goes to Hell. Why is that Sheriff Woody? Why is there a butt? In the last episode, our hero, Cork, the Toy Hunter, had defeated the Cactus Man of Mexico, and no one had seen him since. The voice guy talks about the level like he's narrating an episode of Dora. His home is a toy box full of fun things. There, Cork is reunited with his fellow toys. The whole gimmick of this level is that it tells a story. A lot of the traps are actually story cutscenes, so if you want to watch the story unfold, you gotta figure out which spots not to mark. Which is pretty easy. The horror monitor just tells you which ones are cutscenes. After we get our ticket, we're then placed into the role of Cork. He's pretty much just Woody Indiana Jones, and uh, we embark on a quest to save our lost love. Sex the doll. Welcome home, darling. How was my This is a lot. Uh, <laughs> this is a lot. Sexy doll. I love how often they say that stupid name. Like, it's just a normal character thing to have nobody... Is, any, is anybody looking at the same thing I am? I don't know why Ill Bleed of all games thought, hey, let's parody Toy Story. But it is the most ludicrous Toy Story parody you will ever see. You got Woody and Buzz and they gotta rescue Sexy Doll. Just replace Sid's room with, uh, hell. Yeah, she went to hell. Our owner, the kid, <laughs> died and he got buried with his favorite toy. Henry, sleep in peace. Here's your favorite sexy doll. She'll come for you. What the shit? So when this happens, the toy goes to hell. So it's like, oh no, now we gotta find a way to hell and rescue Sexy Doll. And they really make you play this entire level as this ridiculous character. I look like a murderer in a Sheriff Woody mascot costume. I look like I'm playing a, a GTA San Andreas mod. Why does Woody have a pistol? Oh, holy shit, this thing's awesome. Wow! <laughs> I've never had a battle go so well. <laughs> look, look at this. Look at this. Hey, can you be? He couldn't save his sexy doll. He ended up in hell. And as far as Texas gunmen go, he's chicken. I don't know what's happening. What is going on? Why are they singing? What is happening? Oh shit, they're attacking me now. Well, I have a super gun. It's not that hard to beat them. Oh shit, we're getting arrested for egg murder. Egg murderer! Now we're getting sent to Alka Toys. And then we have this Buzz Lightyear character to help us break out of prison. God, does this guy ever go on a journey? Desolate towns, jail, murky sewers, catacombs with hanging corpses, and of course, even hell itself. Oh, sorry, no, I mean toy hell. Cork can't go to regular hell because Sexy Doll went to toy hell, which also exists alongside regular hell. If you just die normal, you go to normal hell. But if you die being buried with your dead toy kid owner, then, then you go to toy hell. So Cork has to find a new child to own him. Then you kill the child. You kill a human child in this game. We get buried with him and we finally land in toy hell where we have to fight Toy Balthazar himself, Satan Incarnate, Sonic the Hedgehog. I promise you, I am not making any of this up. All of this happens. All of this happens. 
He even does the spin dash. Rings even fall out when you shoot him. In fact, you have to shoot at the rings themselves to actually do damage. Oh my god, did he really just do that? Yeah, he did. Wow. Talk about nail on the head. And it's so funny too, because this game was not made by Sega. It's not like a cheeky self-reference or them using a character that they actually have the rights to. No, I guess they just kind of felt like making Sonic the bad guy. I don't know why, but it's amazing. Oh, and if you're wondering what they made him sound like, he never talks, he just kind of stands there and looks menacing. I think it would have been really funny if they got Ryan Drummond to voice this guy too, but that probably would have been a little bit too on the nose. You inputted the wrong settings, didn't you? No, I, I swear I said it to fate. After the fight, we get the scene where these two operators mess something up, and they debate making us redo the fight nine more times to fix it. Until the player completely clears the setting, it can't be reset. You mean they have to battle nine more times? Thankfully, the game doesn't actually make you do that. They just say that to scare you. Instead, Cork and his friends get impatient and just ride off into the sunset. Well, the fiery inferno of hell, actually, but I thought sunset sounded better. All right, now all we got left is the final showdown. So yeah, actual last warning for spoilers. I'm gonna be showing the final boss fight, what that whole sequence all looks like, and uh, then I guess we'll go through all three endings. So we finally walk into the Michael Reynolds Museum, and it is this ridiculously extravagant cathedral featuring various bits and pieces of Reynolds' past work, and some other weird shit too. What is with this game and big asses? I found an Uzi. That'll come in handy. Pretty soon, we're then greeted by Michael Reynolds himself. You've managed to make it to the last room before you'll get out of it, please. He looks like the banker from Deal or No Deal. <laughs> well, the deal he's given us here is that you get to choose from one of three bosses. That'll be the final boss, and if we beat that, the billion dollars is ours. We got, I guess, an actual fight with Cashman. We got Bull Stinger and Oh No Man. <laughs> oh no, it's Oh No Man. Well, we gotta go with Oh No Man. Yeah, it's not really much of a final fight. He kind of just hits you with some standard kicks, some standard slashes that aren't all that hard to dodge. And you hit him with the Uzi every time you get a chance. And after a few minutes, I had him beat. Reynolds then congratulates us, even treating us to an orchestra and everything, and then we get the 100 million dollars. The reward money was real this whole time. I'm the man of my word. Here. Wow, I can finally afford the next horror game I want to make a video about. Congratulations. Good luck. Bye bye. And with that, we get the credits. So, uh, since we didn't save one of our friends, we're getting the bad ending after this is over. Sure, I won a million bucks, but lost all of my friends in the process. And elderly Erico reminisces about all the friends she lost at the park, and she won a million bucks, but can't even enjoy it because all her friends are dead. You make it sound like I killed everybody. Like, I only let like, Kevin die? Give me a break! Kevin sucks! Goodbye, my friends. I'll miss you. If you then load your completed save file, you'll enter a new game plus. You will have to save all your friends all over, which is kind of a bummer. I was hoping you'd be able to play like earlier levels as later characters, but I guess not. So that means Jorg is still pfft. You will get to keep all of your upgrades though, which is super duper handy. Not only because that means that you're super strong right out of the gate this time, but also because now you don't have to spend your money on operations. You can just blow it all on a ton of healing items instead. The game is so easy now. You can tank everything and just heal right on up. It made replaying the game for the good ending a total breeze. Okay, so I get all the way through the game again. I save Kevin this time along with everybody else too. And the final scene with Reynolds, it's exactly the same. Yeah, I picked Yorg. I guess I lied. You can play as him in two rooms of the game. And the whole world too, I guess. But that's really it, I swear. The fight still plays out the same. You pick one of the three bosses. Uh, I picked Cashman this time. Kind of neat how there's a version of this battle where you actually fight him, but once again, pretty easy. We then get the orchestra and the $100 million again, but this time after the credits, we're instead treated to a scene of the gang going on vacation after winning the prize money. How are we gonna spend a million bucks? After some idle Chit chat, Eriko then cryptically declares that she's going back alone this time. I'm going back to Illbreed. 
What? 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 But this time, I have to go alone. You know what that sounds like? Why? Sounds like a hint to replay the game with only Eriko. Let's try that. Reload her completion save, and uh, let's save nobody this time. Oh darn, I was not fast enough to save Kevin. Sorry, buddy. I didn't mean to do that on purpose. Coming back to the hub area, something is certainly a little different. Okay, well, well, at least the game reacted to that. We gotta be doing something right. So I blast the worm level again. I skipped a garage entirely. Sorry, Michelle. Uh-oh, I'm noticing a trend here. Running through wood puppets again. Not even gonna get Randy's brain. Um, wait, what happens if you save him without getting the brain? Oh, wait, this is actually different. I didn't think it would let me save him. Wait, brainless Randy? Why, well, I, I can't even do anything. He literally has zero adrenaline. You can't even use the horror monitor. He has no brain, he's useless. That is amazing that you can actually do this. All right, well, I'm glad I got that curiosity fulfilled. Let's reset and finish the level with Adam. Each time you don't save one of your friends on this playthrough, Eriko's clothes will deteriorate every time you come to the hub world. More and more until... What? The fuck? I don't think I can even show this. I mean, like, I guess her parts are covered, but like, by microscopic specks of mud. I'm sorry, I'm not taking any chances on YouTube here. What? What is this? Why? Maybe they're trying to be like, hey, it wouldn't be a shitty horror movie without titties now, would it? And yeah, I get the fun, I get the goof, but I don't know, I just feel... I'm almost 30 years old. I feel kind of uncomfortable when media tries to make me a peeping Tom to teenagers. You know what I mean? But man, Jesus Christ, like this sounds like the kind of thing a kid would make up on the playground. You gotta get the good ending, and then on your next playthrough, don't save any of your friends, and Erica will get more and more naked throughout the game. But it's real. This is real. And that's not even the most ridiculous part about this. When you enter the museum this time, Reynolds is like, yo, are there boobs down there? And he rushes down and... He's an alien? Eriko? Yeah, then he realizes he's talking to his daughter. That's bad. Oh my god. Yeah, it turns out Reynolds is actually Eriko's father this whole time. His obsession with scaring her drove him to create ill bleed. The only thing that he thought could finally scare Eriko. Oh, come on, Dad. I passed your fear factor test when I was a kid. Nothing scares me or is a thrill anymore. They talk for a while, but basically Eriko's really pissed off that she can't feel scared by anything anymore because of how desensitized the fear he made her. But hopefully that won't last long because Reynolds explains that he created three special super scares. You could die. Eriko, this is the chance you've been waiting for. I want you to get shocked, scared, terrified. <sighs> We're then handed the special horror monitor. So we have to look at these nine obelisks. Three of them have a trap that's super powerful, and three of them have an item we have to find. You can only mark three of the obelisks though, so you have to be really careful. <laughs> I got hit by all three, but they didn't really seem to do much to me, though. I wonder if it's because I'm fully upgraded. Totally unfazed by Reynolds' final test, Herico turns the tables and scares him. <laughs> My heart! Michael Reynolds then transforms into a giant super goo monster, and the final <laughs> battle begins. As per usual, it's not really all that hard. He only has this one laser attack, and it's pretty simple dodging, so you run some laps, fire off that Uzi a bunch, and before you know it, the fight will be over. But wait, there's more. His head then splits open, revealing a brain and a spine, and it floats into the air and sprouts wings? Looks like it's time for the real showdown. He's pretty easy, too. You just run laps around them, and they can't keep up with you. As long as you keep doing that, it's really not that hard to keep firing off that Uzi without getting hit. Absolutely wild boss design, though. Like, this thing looks like it's straight out of an ancient eldritch prophecy. It's sick as hell. You actually destroyed yourself. You finally did it. You scared the living hell out of me. Eriko shares a few words with her monster corpse of a father, and then we get the credits. Afterwards, we get an old family photo, I guess, <laughs> and a post credit scene where Kevin explains that Eriko finally has her sense of fear back. Once fearless and strong, she turned into a vulnerable little girl. Wow, Kevin. Who needs a fearless knight in shining armor to protect her, like me. Kevin, you literally suck the biggest fart in this entire game. What, what are you gonna do? Well, now that we've completely beaten the game, there's one last secret to find here. Highlight options and press the X and A buttons together and we'll be brought to a hidden minigame. Whoa, that's a lot of funny little guys right there. 
It's just a simple arcade-like where you jump on top of these falling screw things, and uh, yeah, you just gotta last as long as you can, and uh, once you die, you can post your high score. Oh wow, it even has multiplayer. You can play this with up to four people. I guess it could be kind of fun to uh, see who can last the longest. This is actually pretty fun for, yeah, for like how simple this is. I like the characters a lot too, they're pretty funny. Kind of cool to have one last uh, cherry on top of this, this wonderful and bizarre piece of horror game history. Well, I guess that uh, just about wraps things up. Wow, ill bleed. Yeah, no, it certainly lives up to the blurb on the back of the case, that's for sure. Yeah, no, I've never played anything like this. Though it did get kind of rocky here and there, there are some annoying ass parts to this thing, and I also thought that, like, the level structure could have been a little bit more consistent. The first one definitely felt like it was the one that they actually really tried to get the pacing right. You slowly move through this haunted house with the main Minesweeper gameplay. There, there's a really good variety of rooms, the living room, kitchen, bedrooms. We end up in the basement with a chaser sequence before ending it off with a two-part boss fight. None of the other levels are really paced nearly that well. Maybe Killer Man, but even that one has that big annoying room at the end. The pacing is far from perfect here. Toy Hunter 2, like as much as I love that chapter for just being completely ridiculous and very entertaining, it kind of felt weird that it was a final level. I kind of feel like Killer Man should have been the final level. And you know, there's some design flaws too. None of the characters other than Eriko are even viable, and the save points make the whole live system completely negligible. And the camera during the boss fights can also be kind of disorienting. It follows you very slowly, so if you run around the boss faster than it can keep up, the guy you're fighting will keep going off screen. One last problem I also have with this game is that like, I wasn't seeing what a lot of these traps were, right? Like, the whole gimmick of the game is that there's all these traps, but if you mark them, which is what you want to do, you kind of don't get to see them. Every time I got a right, I could only wonder what the trap would have been if I didn't. I felt that constantly. It's the same problem Eternal Darkness had. The coolest feature of the game, the thing that makes that game that game, are the sanity effects. But since they only occur when you have low sanity, your reward for playing well and keeping your stats up is not getting to see them. And it's weird too, because in the first level, sometimes when you disarm a trap, you still get an animation. It just unfolds in a way that doesn't do you damage. Bodies about to spring to life calm back down. Phantoms and paintings still come out, but they just fail to see you. For this one, the TV still turned on, but I just got this stupid cartoon of a bear falling over. And then nothing bad happened. It was really funny. It kind of seems to me like they put so much effort into this first level, but then as development went on, they weren't able to spend as many resources on every other level. I mean, you gotta be realistic if you're going to finish the game. It would have taken forever to make a secondary animation for every single trap, so I get it. But I still wish I was able to watch the traps go off somehow, maybe even through a gallery or something. But at least everything you're guaranteed to see is an absolute freaking treat. This game doesn't take itself seriously at all. It always keeps you guessing. Every scene is just ludicrous. And it presents it all with an utmost passion for horror. It's not really a scary game, but it sure as hell looks and sounds the part. It's also one of those very few interesting examples of something that deliberately achieves camp. You know, campiness, like when something's so bad that it transcends bad and becomes goofy and charming and great. Stop it! Don't open that door! Not often something you can do on purpose, but man, it's just gotta be that goofy, video gamey voice acting from the time. It just becomes this happy accident that makes this game just as genuine as the things it's parodying, even if it is self-aware. It can be kind of frustrating though, I mean, the learning curve is fairly steep as it is, but on top of that, you also kinda need at least a decent understanding of like, old game clunk to really get through it if that makes sense so yeah it's definitely not for everybody but if old school horror games are your kind of jam then it's absolutely something i would recommend trying so if you're uh, pretty good at clunky combat and managing resources and being prepared and of course you're willing to have a little bit of patience with it you could probably get a lot of enjoyment out of this game in the right hands hill bleed can be a pretty amazing experience too bad the only way to play it right now is on Dreamcast. It's never seen a port or a remake or nothing, and it's going on eBay for prices high enough to buy a dick. A wiener even. 
Dreamcast games are at least easy to burn. Everybody knows that. So if you got a Dreamcast, it's, uh, you know. Hey, James, can I borrow your uh, uh, legally dumped backup of Ill Bleed on CDR? That's your story. Go! But ultimately, it really should get a proper port. It's just way too cool a thing to be this difficult to play. Because let's be real, nobody's going to pay 400 bucks for it on eBay. Get that shit out on Steam at the very least. Somebody's got to have the rights. I can only hope it gets ported to something. I mean, they gotta preserve this game. It's much too interesting a thing to ever be forgotten. I can easily say, with utmost confidence, there's no other horror game quite like Ill Bleed. Thanks for watching me talk about it, guys. I hope you enjoyed this uh, wild ride as much as I did. It's been on the bucket list for almost a decade. No, more than a decade, and I am incredibly incredibly gratified having finished it now so uh yeah thanks for watching i hope you guys all have a fantastic halloween and you all take care of yourselves Something fired, batteries not included.